Richard Cornell was born in 1927 and spent his childhood in Harford City, Indiana. His father, a Presbyterian minister, died when Richard was nine. He left his three sons with a conviction that they had been put in the world for some purpose and a determination to find that purpose and do something about it. The family moved to California in 1937 and settled on the edge of Los Angeles. Richard attended public schools and worked at odd jobs. Lacking his father's clear call to the ministry, Richard decided in his adolescence to study medicine, not in order to practice it, but to promote its socialization. This flirtation with socialism was brief. His older brother Herb introduced him to libertarian thought, and strongly influenced by Friedrich Hayek's Road to Serfdom and Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead, he joined the budding libertarian revival in the mid-1940s. Immediately after his graduation from Occidental College in 1948, Cornell went to New York to study with Ludwig von Mises in his fabled seminar at New York University. He worked as an apprentice to Garrett Garrett, then editor of American Affairs, and his first writing appeared in that quarterly. When Garrett folded the magazine to write his last two books, Richard, groping for his proper role in the libertarian movement, spent two years as an understudy at the Foundation for Economic Education with Leonard Reed and Baldy Harper. Then his brother Herb recruited Richard to join him as a liaison officer at the William Volcker Fund. The fund's purpose was to preserve and protect the remnant of libertarian scholars. Richard spent the next few years in the fund's effort to locate these threatened scholars and devise ways to enlarge their influence. His ideas about the libertarian task were changing. His philanthropic involvement made him more aware of the large number of non-governmental, voluntary institutions in American society. He began to wonder whether these forgotten entities might constitute an alternative to the modern welfare state. Cornell decided that libertarians were not involved in a debate, but in a practical competition for results. He set out to demonstrate the forgotten capacities of what he called the independent sector, developing and promoting voluntary alternatives to address challenges such as the hardcore unemployed, the need for low-cost housing, and the renewal of neglected neighborhoods. These efforts all showed promise, and the flagship national program, United Student Aid Funds, which guaranteed billions of dollars in bank loans to college students who could not qualify for commercial credit, was dramatically successful. Richard wrote his first book, Reclaiming the American Dream, which described America's unparalleled machinery for voluntary social action in large, bold terms, not as a useful adjunct to government, but an essential alternative to it. Two years later, pollster George Gallup said the book had sparked the most dramatic shift in American thinking since the New Deal. Politicians of both parties embraced the independent sector, but as a neglected instrument of the state, rather than an alternative to it. In 1975, Cornell published a much humbler, almost penitential book, Demanaging America, in which he explained the futility of efforts to reform society with the very methods that were constraining it, and described a new kind of society that was developing spontaneously outside the political process. Cornell believes that this spontaneous initiative is now gathering momentum, and the great emancipating social transformation is underway. And the present task is to understand and encourage it. Liberty Fund welcomes you to a conversation with Richard Cornell. You've been um, working in the world of philanthropy and libertarian thought for a long time. And we want to go back and see how some of your ideas develop. But I know you've got some current enthusiasms that are taking a lot of your time and attention. Uh, you know, Mark Twain once said that the only thing sadder than a young pessimist was an old optimist. But uh, in, in, uh, in my older years, I've become less and less pessimistic and more and more optimistic, sort of reversing the, that, that, that uh, motto. Uh, I, I, I really believe that there are unmistakable signs all over the place 
that the society that the society is trying to improve itself, is trying to 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 resolve some of the conflicts that troubled the 20th century in so many different ways. Uh, I, I, I spent my life trying to be a, a conscious reformer in various ways that we can talk about later. Uh, but what's encouraging about what's happening now is it seems the society is trying to reform itself and that all those of us who uh, are, you know, sort of dedicated to the idea of a good free society, uh, our, our, our role has changed somewhat. We need to help people understand what it is they're doing, develop a rationale for this, this sort of spontaneous kind of change. And and you know supply a little body English and direction and a helping hand here and there, but uh, it's a it's an entirely it's becoming an entirely different world. I think. Give me some examples. Well, I think the moving force. I, I've I've uh, I'm working on a on a book which will be a kind of val victory. I hope we finish it within the next year or so. I've been working on it for uh, all my life, I guess, in a way, and, and, and very consciously for the last five or six years. But the working title I had on the book was um, borrowed from the Russian revolutionary Chernyshevsky, who called, uh, called his, it was, a, it was curiously a novel, or quite a bad novel, called What is to be Done? And the subtitle on some editions was Tales of New People. And I think the driving force behind the kind of uh, transformations that I feel so encouraged about is in the, is in the character of the people that make up the society. Chernyshevsky, incidentally, was a, sort, sort of a, you know, quite a bad guy, and and uh, and uh, because the kind of new people he was talking about were not the sort of new people I'm talking about, but that's aside from the point. Uh, but I think that for that one of the things that's 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 misshapen uh, social life in the 20th century has been a very pessimistic attitude about the capacities of of, of Ordinary people that developed toward the end of the of the of the nineteenth century, understandably. We were the biggest, the most rapid industrialization in the history of the world took place in the United States in the period of about from after the Civil War till about the turn of the century. I mean, this astonishing growth. At the same time, the biggest movement of people from all over the world came to the United States. Uh, not being able to speak the language, some of them full of sort of revolutionary ideas that troubled the the, uh, uh, the, the existing establishment, uh, and a and a and a society that seemed to be c becoming uh, more complex and less comprehensible by the by the day. So the intellectuals of the time developed a kind of Kent consensus, which I believe guided public policy and private policy in many ways for for all, the whole of the next century. That was based on a pe pessimistic assumption about the capacity of ordinary people. They, they, <coughs> they thought that they would be uh, unable to deal with these. That the new complexities would be would create problems that were unfamiliar to them, and with which they would could not and without and, and maybe were unable would always be unable to to deal with. So that led to a, a kind of canon that said that. In, in this newly complicated age, uh, a lot of social and economic activity was going to have to be regimented. Uh, and the canon included the idea of monopoly, uh, concentration of authority, and, and perhaps most important, the intervention of a layer of professionals between ordinary people and their work or in, in the important decisions about their lives, where there's the, the choice of the uh, of schools for their children, provision for their health, provision of retirement, all sorts of things. People were thought unable to that, and, that, and those responsibilities were gradually transferred to a, a body of career professionals, uh, which grew up and flourished in the 20th century. In so many ways, it seems like the late 19th, 19th century America was a great triumph of individual liberty and creativity. Um, personal initiative, and yet, as you're saying, all these reformers began to think everything was out of control and chaotic. Where did they get these ideas, and where were, where do they go with them? The the most interesting thing is, and I think there's a kind of, uh, I think there's a wide acceptance of this idea that the model for social, the, the kind of social uh, uh, organization that was appropriate to this unexpected new complexity 
was the, was the corporation. The corporation was developing rapidly. Uh, it's, it's, the, the, it was very clear, as you say, that the, this new economy was vastly more productive. I mean, you, you, know, you could see wages double in a single generation or something like that, whereas for centuries they'd be lucky if they increased at all. Uh, and, but the, corp the corporation seemed to be the responsible agency. Uh, and they attributed I, what I think, in retrospect, was a mistaken importance to the way the corporation's interior was organized. And the, the monopolist thought, the, 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 the corporate head thought that monopoly was a good idea if he could achieve it, uh, that, that uh, if you were going to control a complicated corporation, the, the authority had to be, inf all information and authority had to be concentrated at the top. And they were the first to believe that these uh, uh, people that you know came uh, off farms, or, you know, out, after, uh, after, uh, out of a strictly pre-modern agricultural background, were going to be working in factories. They'd have to be very carefully supervised. So the idea of a of a, of a layer of professional supervision, but you know, between the, the the management and the worker was 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 part of the corporation. At that time, this explosion of productivity was attributed to that method of organization. Rather than, and, I mean, I think it's, it really should be attributed to, to the fact that the firms were allowed to operate in free markets. In other words, the free, the, the external affairs of the firm were, were guided by the free market, uh, a, a method uh, that invites change, assimilates change very rapidly. The interior of the corporation was, was organized on an entirely opposite principle. And it was that principle that was used as the model all sorts of organizations inside and outside of government. A, a, a tendency that prevailed through think, by thinking people all through the 20th century that the way to get things done was to was monopoly, hierarchy, and professionalization. Doesn't World War I then sort of show how it could work at, at a great national crisis? Exactly. The, um, the, the, the writer who I found most illuminating on, the, on this business was Robert Nisbet. And, and Nisbet points out that the great application of this idea, the great national application of this idea, was in the management of World War I. But I think the great shaping uh, force, the great uh, uh, polarity that divined the 20th century wasn't the ones we think about in our, most, most, most often. It wasn't capitalism versus socialism. The, the progressives who wrote the canon weren't for socialism. They were for corporations behaving freely if you give, gave them a regulatory framework in which to work. Uh, but they were for uh, regimentation, an opposite form of, uh, for almost all the other activities in the society. You think there's, a, there's some changes afoot. Well, tell, think, tell us some about the changes and, and give, give me some evidence because in a lot of ways it seems like the corporate corporatist model is at its very height. Indeed, you say someplace. The great surprising thing of the collapse of the Soviet Union is that socialism and capitalism have ended up in the same place in a, in a vast and expanding democratic welfare state, which looks like the triumph of corporatism. Corporatism did, did win. Uh, it, it won. It was largely unimpo un uh, unopposed. Uh, I mean, libertarians were in favor, clearly in favor of free markets. Uh, uh, the the first, the, the, you know, the first institution to pr systematically promote the extension of libertarian ideas was called the Foundation for Economic Education. We were talking about the freedom for the corporation to behave in, in markets. We we were si we were silent on this other, on, on this other form on this form of interior organization the kind of, that that, uh, that guided the corporation. Uh, so that 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 method did win, I think. It came to it came to prevail in almost all all the major American institutions are organized. At, if if I may, at this point, introduce the an, 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 a concept that established as a, a more accurate polarity, I think, for what went on in the in American society in the 20th century, and that's distinct the distinction between cosmos, which is the were to describe what's uh, more commonly called spontaneous order, and taxes, which is uh, a term that's more used to be contrived order. Uh, so 
one way to look at the American experience was to say that its economic activity was governed according to cosmos. Uh, it's the pursuit of knowledge in the natural sciences was organized by was, was organized according to cosmos. Uh, all virtually all the other activities of the society, uh, the, the 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 organizational model was taxes, uh, hierarchy, monopoly if possible, and uh, and and prof and professionalization. And moreover, and that's the bad news, people were. If, affected by this. People were altered by it. The American mm -hmm. character was altered by the fact that the ordinary American's experience was go to a regimented school, get a job in a regimented corporation, uh, get his, his health care from a regimented <laughs> hospital, and, and it's no, no, not surprising that his capacity for, uh, you know, exercising his own, uh, for, for, you know, he wasn't a self-ruling, self-governing purpose. He became rather the passive, uh, uh, benefit-hungry sort of uh, chap they, they, that, that he was assumed to be by the designers of the progressive canon. So, so they I, sort of I, create the man they need. Exactly, they need exactly. For their exactly. ideas to work. Exactly. Yeah. Now, what's happened most recently, and you know, some of us have been watching, hopefully, for, for years, was that the, uh, that the corporations began to change their method of interior organization. The new model was, the, was in a way, the net. Uh, at first, there was a big, in the, in the first phase, there was a big, wise and wonderful central computer and a lot of dead-end uh, terminals that could take instruction. Pretty soon, with miniaturization and, and the rest of it, which happened so slowly in a couple of, so rapidly in a couple of decades, all the terminals were as intelligent as the center and it became possible to imagine what nobody could imagine before, and that was an organization that had cohesion without uh, centralization, concentration of authority. So you began to see uh, corporations flattening out, and as people became more self-managing than being managed by that layer of professionals, as all that, you remember all the many middle managers right. that got canned in the, in the 80s and 90s, uh, uh, you, you began to see the character of the people altered, you know. So when I put on my book as a working title, Tales of New People, and the reason for my... This is the new book that you're new book, still yeah, to work on. That I'm still to work on, that, that, that suddenly we'll, these new people will make it possible to think about an entirely different kind of society that's ordered in a way that doesn't repress personality, that doesn't uh, 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 eliminate... Uh, Invention and 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 really makes uh, and really r really makes it possible for us to pick up again the idea that very ordinary people could live very extraordinary lives, which was the idealism that you find so much in the in the nineteenth in nineteenth century literature. You said earlier that one of the reasons why the corporatist uh, progressivist view of things became such a fixture of the American outlook in the 20th century was that there wasn't any opposition to it. And you were part of a, a rather small group of people but that began to put together some intellectual opposition to it in the middle late 40s. The first thing that sort of determined the trajectory of my life and work was that my father was a minister of the gospel, a Presbyterian minister in a little county seat town in Indiana. Uh, he died when I was nine years old. And like, a, and like a lot of other progressives did, because a lot of the early progressives were ministers' sons who lost their faith and decided to express their humanity through you know, social reform, uh, that, that was very much a part of my background. Mm -hmm. I, I, felt, I felt like I, I, I couldn't really honor, honorably be a, a, a minister, so what's the next best thing? And I thought about being a doctor and so forth. And I, you know, and I think that's what made me for my whole life, I pursued the idea in one way or another, but I was a do-gooder. I, you know, I wanted to make the world more habitable for uh, people. And after your father died, I guess that um, part of your, uh, of your youth was, was in Southern California, yeah. where yeah. so many different peoples did come together, where so many new things were happening. Then, then in the working along, I was, I, uh, my brother was, my older brother was, 
who I absolutely worshipped, was became a sort of father and brother to me because he was seven years old. I was nine. He was sixteen when my father died. So when he went off to war, he started reading. Uh, he was out on the Pacific Island and reading various books, and among them was the uh, uh, Road to Serfdom, mm. and uh, and 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 I, you know, I think I got drawn to the that sort of li uh, libertarian view simply because I thought my brother would never be wrong about anything, and so I just this is her. got it. This is my brother Herb, and uh, and that's th that's what opened the door. Herb wasn't it wasn't so much a, Herb was not such a mystery. Who was a mystery was the guy that got Herb in, interested in in, in, the, in the libertarian movement, which almost didn't exist then. It began right just toward the end of the war. As I, as I understand it, or as my experience suggests, uh, Herb was Herb had worked uh, before he went into the Navy uh, for a guy named uh, Lauren B. We all called him Red Miller, uh, who worked for a. a, a, a in, in those days, I, I think they're not as active as they once were. But most cities had a privately financed kind of watchdog agency who would keep track of municipal performance. And, Miller ran that organization, and uh, and Herb, Herb, when he got out of college, got a scholarship to a, a course in public administration at the University of Denver, and his, and was assigned to Kansas City to uh, do a study of the uh, uh, Cookingham City Manager's Office that had succeeded the horrible Pendergast machine, which Miller had, had been had one, 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 very important in running it out of town. Uh, during the time he ran out, it ran, he ran, was running <laughs> Pendergast out of town. His his front man was a was a local businessman named Harold Luno, who uh, eventually became the head of a, of a of a foundation called the William Volcker Fund, which was one of the first entities that began systematic to realize a that the rationalization of of a free society had was in danger of getting lost because academics had had in a, had so completely uh, gone over to a, an, an alternative view that uh, the sort of preservation and, and, and expansion of it was an urgent task. And this foundation, acting on the advice of Miller, uh, uh, big, made that a specialty. And, uh, and Herb was the first director and, uh, of the Volcker Fund. So you went to work for Volcker also? Yeah, after, after a while. I did various other things. I, I went to, I went to um, and, and then the great, uh, the great Gray Amanos uh, of uh, libertarianism was uh, Ludwig Mises. He was teaching in a seminar in New York City. And when I got, got out of college, I went to study with him for a couple of years. I worked on a, on a, on a periodical that was more uh, conservative, perhaps, than libertarian in those days called American Affairs, which was published by a wonderful old uh, um, uh, writer and editorialist named Garrett Garrett, uh, who was very important. So you worked for Garrett Garrett for a while and, and attended the Mises seminar. Yeah. And Mises himself, I guess, had been supported by the Volcker people by at that point. Who were some of the other people in New York in those days? And what, what was going on? What it, it, Looking well, back on it, do you find it exciting? Well, it, was, and it was a very exciting time. We were, uh, 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 we were, there were very few. There were very few people. I used to say that we would have fit in a phone booth, and that that was not so far. It was not much of an exaggeration. But the but the people there were all wonderfully kind of eccentric and outspoken and uh, and uh, different. And we had a great sense of uh, camaraderie because we were all fighting this enormous losing battle, and but in, enjoying the doing of it. Mark Murray Rothbard was a was a part of that group, and. Uh, and, and Rose Lane was somebody I visited in Connecticut often, and Henry Hazlitt, who was a Newsweek columnist, who wrote a bestseller called uh, "Economics in One Lesson." Frank Meyer was he even Frank, involved there? Yeah, yeah. Frank. Uh, parallel to the the uh, at that time, uh, uh, there was was almost from the beginning a, uh, a a clear division between conservatives and, liber and, and libertarians. Some some of the younger libertarians did, thought we're sort of anti-conservative, uh, uh, and uh, because we were, we were much, we were much, we were thinking in much more revolutionary terms, not in a violent sense, but in the in the sense that we wanted to, uh, we wanted to really 
change the society. We had a we had a we had a much clearer vision of hell than we did of heaven. I mean, we knew what was bad about uh, a centralized society. We weren't nearly as uh, articulate about what a good society would be like. But I think the unease I felt was one of the things that kept me looking for uh, other dimensions that weren't being covered. Although at the time I was an absolutely loyal, card-carrying, uh, unreconstructed libertarian. Where did these other chances develop? Where, because they did, you you moved away from just being a part of that narrow libertarian movement in Manhattan. What what happened was that we we had decided. Hayek had written, a, Hayek had written an essay called The Intellectuals and Socialism, which was a sort of a book on strategy. You know, how do, how do, how, how do we, how, how do we uh, uh, what's the real way to extend this movement? And, and, and Hayek didn't put it this way, but what we got out of it was that it was that any mass movement that didn't have an intellectual base was doomed from the beginning, and, and, that, and that there wasn't any intellectual base for uh, free, free markets, at least not a very solid and visible one. And uh, that it, that was an absolutely uh, primary task. So, so Miller, who I mentioned earlier, is my f brother's first mentor. And although nobody knows where Miller came from, he just mm. he came out of the blue somewhere. There are lots of people out in the Midwest <laughs> yeah, like that yeah, in those right, days. Right. Shouldn't have been a surprise. And, uh, he persuaded uh, the the guy who ran the Volcker Fund, Harold Luno, to uh, who had been his partner in the Pendergast out uh, uh, ouster. To, to specialize in, in identifying and helping libertarian scholars. And we marched out, you know, with our checkbooks trying to, thinking it was good, this was going to be easy. It turned out there weren't very many left, uh, and, and it became... Uh, but you actually set out systematically to find these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, uh, we, uh, we put a little team together, a remarkable bunch of people, four of them, uh, Murray Rothbard, uh, Rose Wilder Lane, Frank Meyer, uh, and the fourth was a, a, a wonderful uh, Hungarian, uh, George de Hussar. And what was characteristic, what was a surprising characteristic of all four, four of these people, all four, was that uh, they they slept in the daytime and worked all night. Uh, they, they, and, and we are used to say that, but Rosalind probably didn't sleep at all. We couldn't couldn't imagine how she could get as much done as she did as a kid. So they read tons and tons of journals and for us and looking for somebody that made a suspiciously libertarian sound. And if we, they did, we'd follow up and, and read their work more carefully and then eventually visit them. And in time, we developed contacts with several hundred, if not a couple of thousand, of uh, people who needed to be encouraged in various ways. Some of them were senior scholars that we simply wanted to expose younger scholars to for instruction and, 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 and uh, the rest. And I, you know, I, think we made it, I think we made an important uh, Contribution, I think. In retrospect, knowing what we know now, it wasn't uh, it wasn't quite what we intended to accomplish, but it w but we accomplished a very important thing. And, and now it was that when the uh, when the Russian economy finally collapsed, you know, Mises had said it was bound to collapse in the essay in 1922 or something like that. Uh, we had a we had a ready-made, widely understood, acknowledged. Uh, rationale for why it failed, and and had that not existed, probably that that uh, collapse might have been read wrong and think, well, they just had the wrong guys, and, and there was nothing the matter with the uh, the centralized method of uh, of national economic planning. That so the Volcker people had begun uh, 40 years earlier to, to, yeah. to find the people to put yeah. together yeah. what would become that explanation. Yeah. Remarkable. But as we did that, and as we got better at it, and as the as it became more routine, it also became more expensive. And at the beginning, the, 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 we, we were so unsuccessful in finding people that we had more money than, uh, than people to give it to. But as, the, as, our, as, our, under, you know, as our, our knowledge of this population grew and grew, we, got, uh, we needed more and more money. And so we began to look jealously at the part of the foundation's money that had traditionally been spent for uh, welfare, you know, conventional welfare mm -hmm. activities. So we we uh, began to uh, figure out ways to get that money into our, our <laughs> side of the office instead of the other side. And but instead, it caused me to realize an embarrassing admission at this stage uh, of the game. But I, we began to realize that there was out there uh, an alternative to 
to government action on on social problems, which we had never, uh, uh, oddly enough, had never really. It wasn't in our consciousness. They were already they were there, there. I mean, at we'd work. All, we'd all driven by on. by hospitals and uh -huh. private colleges and private agencies and gave to the United Fund. Wait, but we didn't. We just thought that was part of the furniture or something. I, you know, it wasn't thought to have any. There was no. There was nothing in the sociological literature about it to speak of. It was just there, and in, and it become so much a part of American life, it was invisible. So that caused me to to think, and then so suddenly it satisfied my not only my sort of libertarian, you know, freedom for everybody uh, impulses, but my do-good impulses, because it looked like there was a there was at least a vestige of an, of an alternative to the state in, in, in solving the problems of, uh, 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 of people that were in, uh, in real distress of some sort or other. So I got, I got very excited about this, uh, this phenomenon, as I saw it, began to try to educate myself about its scope and possibilities and the rest of it, and a kind of theory about how we both and, and that that, uh, that led me to what led eventually to the publication of my first book, and the most popular book I ever wrote was Reclaiming the American Dream. 1965. 65. Yeah. Right. So you've been thinking about it this issue for some time before you actually yeah, wrote I, down the book. I thought about it. I, th I kept thinking about it, and and then and I and I and I I decided it was a hell of a good idea. Uh, but I decided that it wouldn't it wouldn't communicate if it were just if it were just an abstraction if I just went around and told the well there's an alternative here and why don't you get busy and do something I, I thought it would only have bite if we could point to an example if we had if we had said we're going to put the eight ball in the side pocket and did you know we decided an example of, of we decided of to mount an, uh, uh, some demonstration of the neglected power of a of a force in American life that was underutilized. And Which you could. call then the independent sector. Yeah. I, I was, Frank Meyer was there, there when I did that. I, I, I wanted, I knew, knew it had to be, the, uh, Tocqueville had written about it, Tocqueville had written about it in the, in the uh, 1830s, I think, about uh, the thing that he thought was most remarkable about Americans was when something went wrong, they didn't call on a man of rank or uh, police or something, they uh, formed their own group and did something to it. He, he, he called it, he seemed to call it a kind of uh, propensity for organization or something, but he didn't really give it a name. So I thought this kind of activity needed a name. And Galbraith had just read, published a, a very widely uh, uh, read book, at least read uh, by uh, Galbraith called uh, uh, The Affluent Society. And, and he suggested we look at the world with a, you know, as being composed of two forces. One, uh, the public sector, by which he meant all governmental agencies, and the private sector, by which he meant commerce, mm -hmm. and and this meant that this whole, you, you know, middle kind of of activity that was neither governmental nor commercial, had no identity, no name. Galbraith hadn't noticed it either. And Galbraith hadn't noticed it either, right. and nobody else had noticed right. it. So you go go off to. To set up a demonstration project. Yeah, we, well, we set up several. And, and who yeah. is we? Is this still the Well, Walker this was Fund, a or? ridiculous little <laughs> band of, of uh, quixotic idealists who uh, was a guy named Bill Johnson who worked was my associate, and uh, then I had some very important volunteer help from from businessmen, particularly in in, in Indianapolis, and uh, then uh, four or five other people, and we started uh, we started several. Projects. We started one uh, that, uh, and I think I think it was in Knoxville, uh, that had a private alternative to urban redevelopment. It was a scheme that where it, you know uh, decay seemed to be contagious. One building would go down and the other one, but but it wasn't so hard to reverse it. It was hard to build to restore one building when all the rest of the buildings. Were. So this somebody, some wonderful social inventor had. Had, had figured out a way that you, you would trade your deed to a, a building within this area that they were trying to redevelop for stock in a corporation, so you had a stake in the whole thing yeah. rather than just the one thing. Oh, and you know, we, yeah. we bankrolled yeah. that and reported on it. Success. It, was a bit, it was very successful. This is entirely non-government. It wasn't based on eminent domain or anything of the sort. Just my then uh, 
Then we did a, uh, an employment program in Indianapolis. And our ambition was that uh, we wouldn't consider anybody unemployable and that we'd try to, if, he, if we really called him unemployable, we'd find uh, something to do for him. But we really would like to uh, uh, find work for, we would like to solve the employment problem, in, at least in one labor market. But, but the big one was, um, our big demonstration was, uh, was uh, came to be called United Student Aid Fund. And it's uh, because we, we perceived that, well, loan, student loans to pay for your ed education it was much, very much in disrepute. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they weren't widely utilized. But our studies showed that they could be useful uh, and that they hadn't been used often because they had two so the restrictions on them were kind of silly and because they colleges had a bad reputation for paying them back and so forth. So we copied a formula that was pioneered in Massachusetts where you, buy, you put a fractional reserve in the bank that gave value to your co-endorsement of a, of a loan to a student, which would kind of ensure the bank that it was going to be repaid. And uh, then we uh, um, enlisted a lot of banks uh, all in all, 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 most of the states, wasn't, wasn't it? It was never entirely national because there were other uh, organizations that stopped chain, called it called it United Student Aid Funds and raised a lot of reserve money and made uh, and guaranteed you know billions of dollars mm -hmm. worth of uh, worth of loan. You talk about United Student Aid Funds in your first book, Reclaiming the American Dream, but you talk about a lot of other things too. And really, it's a great vision about about what the American Dream has been and might be again. How did you come to write that book? I thought, in my naivete, that it was um, that I was going to start a revolution. That um, I, I said in the chapter, if there's one man like the guy who helped me do this, put this thing together, uh, there are probably a thousand more, and they could change the whole uh, face of the the nation. And and I really I I believe that. I mean I. The, the logic of what we did was that here's a, here's a rationale, that, that, there, that here's, here's a big neglected asset uh, of, of people that are not only uh, uh, able to help, but are willing to help, anxious to help, almost. It's the kind of thing we saw the, the other day. I, I, you know, I, th I think I said in that book for the first time, in, in, in any kind of situation where s some identifiable individual is in trouble, and the way to be helpful to that person is obvious. There's no arguing about it. You don't have to go to social work, get a degree or anything. You just go do it. When there's a situation like that, Americans' response, his response is always enormous. I mean, gigantic, excessive even, you know? So I was saying, look, if we, we've proved in United Student Aid Funds that a, few, a handful of eccentric guys can put it together an organization that meets the whole, the whole reasonable need for student loans, you know, action and glue, right, the way we did. Uh, think of what we could do all together if ever, you know, if, there were, if, that, if that got popular. I mean, we proved it can do it. And I thought there'd be a lot of imitation. I, I, I really did think, because I got a lot of mail, I got a, 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 a lot of uh, lecture invitations. I was running around all over the place making speeches and so forth. And I, I really thought I'd, I had started a movement. The, tr the reality was that I don't, I, I, to this day, I don't know of a single uh, entity that was inspired by that point of view or that uh, challenge uh, uh, at all. One of, the, one of the things I regretted forever, although it was a fabulously important lesson, was that the people who were most interested in it were politicians. And and I was I think I was so I was seduced by the politicians. I mean they they they, they, they this this rhetoric is great and pe you know people love it that we're going to get uh, private action on public problems and save money and the rest public of private it. partnership yeah all that kind of stuff. So we learned a lot of how to make voluntary action work, and we also learned about how not to promote <laughs> it uh, uh, its extension. I think. And, but I was still puzzled about what the right way to, 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 to uh, uh, extend it was, an enormously illuminating flop. About, about 10 years after uh, Reclaiming the American Dream, you do another book, I guess 
not quite 10 years, Demanaging America, which is a, I guess from my point of view, a more gloomy book, uh, based, I guess, part on, on, on some sobering developments that took place through the United States Student Aid Fund experiment and other things. Well, I think, you know, I think, the, I think the motivation for the book, I, I wrote it, you know, after all this stuff collapsed and all these, this federal effort just kind of fell into rubble uh, after a brief trial, I, I, I was very discouraged. I, I, I had been so sure that I was on the right track. I was trying to make the point that, 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 uh, that if the society is going to improve itself in, the, in, the, in this way, it's probably going to do it by itself. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be, it's going to do it as more and more people begin to feel the inadequacies of the, you know, of present social arrangement and find ways to act on their own uh, in ways that nobody else could devise and, and the rest of it. That, it. that it was more a, that we, it was more something that the society as, this, it, it was, I, I, I think I was beginning to realize that when you, when you say you're going to be a reformer, when you're going to reform the society, you've got to know a hell of a lot about the metabolism of the society. I mean, how, who, who it listens to and what makes it move in different directions rather than stay. It's a, it's a complicated, I mean, American society, is, it's, it's a lot of things, but one of the things is the most complex society probably in the history of the world by far. I mean, the number of organizations that are involved in different ways. So I think I was, I was, I think I was beginning to imply that if the, if the country got any better, it wasn't going to be because guys like me you know, ran around with manifestos about how they, what they ought to do next or something like that. It was going to happen because the dissatisfaction got uh, uh, to be wider and wider, more deeply felt, more important than the rest of it. And that is exactly what happened. I mean, the reason for this optim, you know, this uh, uh, illegitimate optimism that I, I talked about at the beginning is that our, I, th I think uh, there are signs now uh, that, people, that people are changing, people, their character is changing as, as their work arrangements become, uh, put them be, as, as self-management, self-ruling people who replace the kind of proletarianized population that came out of the machine age. You coined the word phrase independent sector to describe what was going on in reclaiming American dream. And I don't think you like that phrase very much. Is it, is it itself too much a taxus kind of word? The problem with the, uh, uh, with the terminology is it puts, it puts government and society on two different, on the same plane. You know, there's a government sector and then there's a thing. Mm -hmm. And my, my thinking is exactly contrary to that. I think that society is the enduring primary uh, 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 structure of the society. I think, I think the society, we the people of the United States, do hereby ordain and establish a, a government that we give certain powers to. It's understood that we can withdraw those powers when we want to, either by voting or by revolution or something like that. But the elemental thing is the society. The state is a separate thing, distinguished by its use, it, it, its ability to tax and command. So I don't want to talk about the independent sector anymore. I want to talk about the unit. I want to talk about uh, state institutions, and I want to talk about uh, voluntary institutions. Some of the voluntary institutions are profit-seeking. Some of them are half and half. Uh, some of them are co-ops. Some of them are, are mutual aid organizations that don't have no eleemosynary uh, uh, ambition. They just want to help each other. Uh, a, a rich array of these things. I think it's desperately important that these, that there more social self-consciousness develop. That people more are more realize what the nature nature of the society is. Well, let me ask you another question. It's a, yeah. it's a bit complicated, and, and, That's and right. it's just something that's troubling me. Back with reclaiming the American dream, uh, you, you said later, later on, a little article you wrote in 90, 1991. Thanks in large part to libertarian scholarship, there is a well understood alternative to the strictly economic half 
of the traditional socialist program, state operation of the nation's economic institutions, and so forth. And there is a well-traveled pathway to change. But then you go on to say, but privatizing the other half of the socialist program, the social services, the democratic welfare state, which we say has become the com common institution of the Western world. When the last state enterprise has gone private, the part that is practically indistinguishable from the West's social service states is another task, is a task of another order altogether. If there are alternatives to the state's failing efforts to get rid of Skid Row, eliminate involuntary unemployment, eradicate illiteracy, provide reasonable pensions, treat the indigent sick, detoxify the environment, and you go on with quite a list there, and you have a list in the Reclaiming American Dream of all these things, too. Now, I think the conservative with a small, small c might say, this is a bit utopian. These aren't problems to be solved and conditions to be eliminated. These are the nature of humanity, that, that you're, you're trying to bite off too much, that a lot of these things can't be ended, can't be dealt with. They're intractable parts of the human endeavor. And all they can be is ameliorated. And the promise too great a change is going to fall into the progressive trap itself. Does any of that ring a bell? Well, it rings a, it, it rings, it rings a bell because it was an issue that I hadn't really thought through till recently. Uh, see, I, I've, I've al almost from the beginning, I, I, wasn't, I, I, I was, I was a, what, what I'd call maybe a philosophical uh, libertarian at the beginning, just believing that it was a, you know, being free and Man's power over man ought to be strictly limited. Right. And, uh, and uh, that was a, it's a good more, place to start. It was, a, it was not a bad place to start. It's a bad place to finish, but it's not a bad place to start. Then, uh, 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 then I, and I, I was perfectly comfortable with this idea and, and grateful for it because where, whereas on Tuesday I didn't have an exam, any answer for anything, I have Wednesday I had an answer for just about everything, you know, and that, which is a great comfort to a kid who just came out of college with a paper that says he knows something. You know. As I read more, uh, I began to develop what was a kind of consequentialist view of libertarianism. And the, ni and the, and the night I described, I, I realized this, this magical circumstances that the morally correct way to organize a society, or let a society organize itself, was the, was the one that worked better. You know, I've been somewhat confused by, by Hayek, who talked about the road to serfdom, and he says the problem is that if you, uh, and I wrote him a letter about this, the problem of giving too much money, to, too much of the responsibility to the state is it'll be turned back on you one day, and you'll be in, you know, the, in the look, inside looking out. And I said, but that, you know, that assumes that it works, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, but if it doesn't, if, if, if it doesn't work, why don't you say, First, that it doesn't work, and then say if you know if anybody doesn't understand that it doesn't work, you know there's a there's a validity about the but but the but isn't our isn't our first case to to make that the that free societies work better than uh, than controlled societies, and and that and that became my you know my my, my starting point on this. Well, what will be the role of the philanthropic institutions in this process and? You, you, you clearly, in a reclaiming the American dream, see many hopeful signs there. But the world of philanthropy, too, has become more bureaucratic, more run by professional managers who've had courses in nonprofit management, uh, less tied to people who've actually made money themselves that they want to devote to philanthropic endeavor, uh, organized in councils and national meetings and uh, and, and increasing the leaders articulate uh, a position that sees much of the philanthropic world as the kind of training grounds upon which new government programs will be based. Um, is there a counter movement in philanthropy that's going along with the counter movement in education that's going to help produce some of these changes? Uh, as, as I see it, the uh, social institutions in order to be brought up to, uh, to, to their, pro brought to their proper f fulfillment, are going to have to displace the existing social institutions, these taxes-based organizations, which incidentally were usually financed by philanthropic money. Uh, 
that was money that was earned by machine, uh, at the beginning was owned by machine age pioneer capitalists, uh, spent on foundations which thought that it should contribute to, to organizations that, that imitated the corporate, the, the corporate form. And it was natural for, for, for businessmen who thought their prosperity was based on their method of organization that they should be, be enthusiastic about that. Now the opposite is, is com coming to pass. The, we're, we're, the, the challenge now is to reverse the thrust of, <coughs> of, of, of enterprisers and, and, uh, and philanthropists to, to see what they can do to encourage uh, the formation of, in of, of institutions of an altogether different sort and to move responsibility in the opposite direction. Well, and I gather that's one of the projects that you yourself and your own uh, the, own found, the foundation you're associated with is beginning to work on and think about ways to encourage that kind of. Yeah, we've got a we've got a little foundation. Um, the first thing the first thing you have to do with an enterprise like that is to remind yourself that uh, the beginning of every uh, large enterprise, the first step is always pathetic in in terms of the size of the ambition. We often think about the guy that. That started building one day, start building the Golden Gate Bridge across San Francisco, and with a shovel. <laughs> they said, "What are you doing? We're building a bridge across, <laughs> across the bay." It seemed like kind of ridiculous. So, uh, but but in a in a in a comparatively small way, we're trying to do three different things in this philanthropic effort that are consistent with this point of view that you and I've been talking about. One, where we don't try to direct or contrive any kind of social change. We really try, in, try to improve the atmosphere in which, uh, which enables the society to heal itself and, and, and grow new institutions and so forth. We've, 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 we think of that as having three dimensions. Just as the institutions of the commercial sector were built by enterprisers and uh, who, who was financed by investors, uh, we think these new institutes will be built by social uh, enterprisers, social so entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and to some degree financed by uh, philanthropic foundations. Uh, uh, and so, in part, we're, we've, be, we've, we've, we've begun the, the last couple of years to identify and give special support to entrepreneurs that have shown unusual imagination in, in taking in the most intractable problems and. And, and drawing largely on local resources, uh, uh, get, getting interesting results. And we continue with that. That's the beginning of what we hope will be a long, <coughs> a larger program of, of, of becoming a source of money and encouragement from, for, for social entrepreneurs who want to uh, move society in that direction. One thing we were, with it, we were we st I started to talk about and, and, and diverted myself was that the third philanthropic, the third activity that we're taking, undertaking, in, 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 to, in, in, in addition to encouraging entrepreneur, social entrepreneurship and, and defining a new kind of philanthropic canon, is to, is to uh, try to stimulate scholarly work of a certain sort. The, the, uh, this was based on the observation that we know a lot about uh, Cosmos and its commercial manifestations, but very little about the rest. So. Uh, we, we've, 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 we've found in, in, in looking at, uh, at this wonderfully interesting period the late, in the late 19th century that at, toward the end of the century, uh, two things happened. One was that uh, uh, serious social thought retreated from the marketplace into the academy and became, so scholarship was almost exclusively the responsibility of, the, of, of, of academics. And at, the ba at, at about the same time, uh, social thought began to compartmentalize itself, to divide itself. This is a part of that same kind of scientific mentality that was so much in the air at that time. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think now it's become more and more clear that two or three things should happen. One, we should try to break the, econo the, economy, the, the, the academy of, the, of, the, of its monopoly and encourage uh, people outside the academy to do serious 
work and thought. There are a lot of good examples. Of some, some of the best work in the 20th century, 20th, 20th century is done by people outside the academy, like Jane Jacobs and, and even well, Lippmann to some degree. I mean, there, there are many, 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 many examples. Uh, that, that tradition ought to be restored, and I think that the, the means to restore it are getting are more and more possible. I mean, work will become less demanding in the sense that it, to take six months off and, and, and study or, or work or educate yourself is, uh, is, is more and more possible. The other thing is we, we think that, that, be, that scholars need to begin to study systematically the metabolism of social processes besides uh, commercial exchange. Uh, you know, what are the, what, what are the, what's the metabolism of, of mutual aid societies? How do they get go? What's the rationale? What are their, we don't, we don't know all the time. We know, we have, we make, we know that the language is a product of cognitive. It's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon. It's essential, absolutely essential. Anybody can, can, can participate in it. Uh, if, if it's not managed, it would be, it would be terrible if it were managed. The contrived uh, language wouldn't be very communicative communicative, and, we, and, and the other is example, but there are many, one of the things I learned in Mises Seminar was that there are many, many uh, other invisible hands at work in the society as besides the one that directs the capitalist to the right investments and so forth. Cosmos is such an exciting idea. It does seem like a thought that could be articulated in a public way by some nationally known figure, perhaps a political figure, in ways that would excite uh, a wide body of the American people, and, and maybe they would even realize it's quite a bit what it describes what they do in their daily lives anyhow. Well, what they've been doing in their daily lives for generations is taxes. I mean, uh, and, uh, uh, and I, but I think the newer generation of people well, who are working in more organ yeah, well, in, in, in their school life, really. and school, and in, absolutely, and the institutions where they go when they get sick, and the institutions that they, you know, for almost, uh, they're still, then that, then they've been conditioned by that. And, uh, but I think there's a yearning for, I think there's a terrific yearning for uh, more involvement. The, 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 the definition of a citizen in the, in, in, in the 20th century, that his job was to vote and pay his taxes, and he had very little responsibility beyond that, is a terribly constraining uh, role for a concerned person to, 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 uh, to fulfill. This, you know, the uh, Cosmos Society did, just looks for ways to uh, his, uh, his or her willing energies to work in some constructive way. That's its appeal, I think. Daniel Pink, I think, and some other theorists have been pointing how many people now really have taken steps in their own lives to move into that world of cosmos. I think he says somewhere 35 million people self-employed or at least partially self-employed or independent entrepreneurs within a bigger operation. That's, that's startling, to, and, and it is becoming a significant figure. I, yeah, I think the number of people who are self-supervising, which is, is, if you want a single measure of what the future society is going to be like, I think that's a very good one. Because, you know, Je Jefferson, used, Jefferson put, put it one way. He said that people who uh, developed habits of subordination working in factories. You know, but John, uh, Jefferson was fascinated by uh, the efficiency of industrialization, fascinated by it, studied was always devising little labor-saving gadgets of his own, you know. But he was opposed to the industrialization of the United States because he thought he saw no alternative to hierarchy in the, in the interior organization. And he thought that moving from being a self-ruling artisan or farmer into a, a regimented factory would uh, cause him to develop habits of subordination that would make him unfit for self-government. Then Hayek later said, uh, how can you expect to to uh, people who have inevitably developed an employee mentality understand the real metabolism of a free society because they're all conditioned in, in, the, in, in the other mode. But now that's changing, and that's a very, very important change in my opinion. And you think that maybe that, that realization could be promoted somewhat by philanthropy itself. Well, yeah, I think you can find things to, I th I th you know, I think it's, it's really kind of analogous to growing a plant as opposed to building a birdhouse or something. You can't, you can't contrive or build it, but you can encourage it and nourish it and, uh, and so forth. And that's the kind of, that's the philanthropy of the future, I, I think. You know, there's a lot of talk these days about community. The, the most publicized form of community that's 
under discussion. It came, came, it came in the wake of, of Robert Putnam's very interesting book about uh, civil participation in, in Italy. But it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of community that again accepts the modernity's limitation of the role of the citizen to voting and paying his taxes. They, when they say he wants to get involved and because he gets involved he's more, the community he's talking about is a political community. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not a helping community. I think, I think right in the teeth of all that, things they're not measuring are happening in a big way. And mu mutual aid associations where you know, everybody who's dying of lung cancer in a certain area gets together and helps each other keep their doctors honest and, and gives you know, comfort and advice and support of all kinds. I mean, those are communities when, those th when that happens. I've, I've seen them and been part of them. Dick, your early friend and mentor, Ludwig von Mises, wrote his great book, Human Action, to talk about the nature of the free human spirit. It seems to me like you're now, through some of your own philanthropic endeavors, trying to recreate some of the things Mises told you and wrote about in those days. Mises was an enormous influence in my life, an abiding influence. That, uh, there, there were others, Hayek and so forth, but, but, but particularly Mises. I was in his seminar for two years and then stayed in touch with him. I, I, his wife was my younger daughter's godmother, and, uh, and we, uh, we, we, we stayed in close, close touch for a number of years. He was a real scholar uh, and uh, uh, a courageous figure in a way. He, he, uh, he came to New York uh, to, you know, to escape the Nazi terror, and uh, his compensation was such that his, he and his wife were both opera buffs, uh, could only afford to buy one ticket, and they went an alternate night. But he worked away and kept writing books and the rest, and we all just loved him. I said, I said one time that if we had, uh, if it hadn't been for the practical difficulties, we would have carved his notes in stone, you know, when he, listening to his lecture. But one of the things that stayed with me all my life uh, was his lecture that's a that's also part of an important part of human action, in which he said that when he, which he talked about praxeology, which is a term for the study of all of human action, the whole circle of human action, uh, and then he'd show a, s a sliver of it, which is human action that eventuated in an exchange, which is what we c we call economics, and which he preferred to call catalactic, and then he'd point to the rest of the the circle and say, and this is the kind of and this is the kind of spontaneous order, the kind of human action that we don't really understand it's in, in, in tabloids. And he was implying that it would, uh, challenging us almost to, 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 to try to fill in, in, in that gap. And, and now I think what was a big, be, what, was t what was, would be intellectually interesting in, in, in those days has now half a century later become almost imperative that we extend our understanding of human societies to these other than economic uh, undertakings. Well, Dick, it's been good to see you again. It's a lot of fun to talk and to hear these stories, some of which I'd heard before, others which are altogether new to me. And uh, you've just had a remarkable career, and I know it's ongoing, and there are some new exciting things to come. We'll look forward to your new book, which will be here in a year or two. Magari, they say in Italy. Exactly. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care.